three, two, one. What is going on, Zach? Hello. So this is pretty exciting. Um, I've been following Broken Curfew Records for some time, and you are their little shining child right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, because of your recent release, and they've been giving you lots of love. And so we're here today to talk about um, your band, Glay, uh, how it came to be, your recent album. And I got a couple questions we can kind of just go through. And uh, it's super exciting to have you on. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, man. Um, so how did you get into music in the first place? Um, well, ever since I was young, I started getting into like, uh, well, I had I had my father's MP3 player and he had like Megadeth and Metallica and ACDC and stuff like that on it. And uh, I quickly attached to the the metal more extreme side of music you know and mm -hmm. uh i remember like watching live like tapes of metallica and being like yep i'm gonna do that <laughs> so uh later on i think i was around 11 i started playing uh guitar and i kind of fell off with it and then for some reason i was like i want to play bass so um in middle school i was around maybe 12 or 13 when i started playing bass and then i was like okay i have a better grasp for what playing a stringed instrument is like and uh so then i decided to pick the guitar back up and um finding a band was not easy in my area so uh eventually in like freshman year of high school i was around 14 when i picked up drums as well uh, and ever since then it's been like a it's been a learning process for sure. Uh, I had another band in the past that I don't really want to dwell on, but uh, cause it's not good, but it was travesty of mankind. I did that for a while. And then I tried to incorporate other members into the band to play live shows and it kind of just fell apart. Um, and then fast forward, I know I'm skipping a lot of details, but fast forward to, I think mid uh, 2021, maybe. And uh, I was helping my buddy start his music project that was going to be called Orange Man. And it was going to be a conceptual, like, comedy metal type deal. And uh, he's he's awesome with writing stories and stuff. And I was like, dude, we can make this happen, you know? Well, we make this one song. I have this first song, um, which ended up being the song Unblinded, which was the first Glay single. But he started doing research when we started to like brand the Orange Man, you know, band, I guess. And there's already an Orange Man. And that mm. crushed him. That crushed him. He he just completely was like, forget this. Back to the drawing board. I'll let you know. And I was like, I'm not throwing this song away. So I decided to start up another one man project. Because Travesty started as one man as well. And then, like I said, I incorporated other people and that led to its downfall. Um, things didn't get done, stuff like that. But uh, that first Unblinded single was originally for something else, but I wrote my own lyrics to it and it was the first Glay single. And ever since then, I've just been trying to capture, you know, what the, the sound that I want and what I want to do, essentially. And so far this past year, I feel like I've been able to get pretty dang close to what I've been set out to do, you know, but it's been awesome. Uh, and yeah, I just pretty much sticking with the one man project thing now. Um, I would say in the long run that, that that's better because if you break up, it's not as disappointing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, tons of bands just can't, can't stick it. Um, I think that's more when they start touring and you get this, like, uh, Metallica is probably the most infamous, you know, uh, Metallica spawned a whole bunch of bands. Um, oh uh, yeah. So it's, uh, but I, I'm not afraid to admit it was Metallica that had the biggest impact on me when I was growing up. <laughs> I, you can, you can definitely see those, uh, I would say they're odes, like an ode to, to music of where, you enjoyed and listened the most you can definitely right. feel the 
it's like a respect and admiration for the style, but you're making it your own. Yeah. And, uh, basically, uh, I had this one buddy who was heavy in the church, um, in middle school and he introduced to me the devil wears Prada with roots above and branches below album and plagues and then uh messengers and thrill seeker by august burns red and then the three for today albums at the time uh ecclesia i think that's how you say it portraits and breaker and that totally changed it you know and then i started doing vocals around that time like experimenting and then by high school I was the weird kid that could do the metal vocals, you know, <laughs> and I'd like to think I got better since then. <laughs> I th I think your, your story is very similar to mine. It's uh it's easier to tell mom and dad, like, Hey, I'm going to a Christian show um, yeah. <laughs> instead of, Hey mom, we're going to go to a mosh pit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hundred percent. The first is easier than the latter. So, Oh yeah. Uh, so you you're talking about your first band and then this uh, concept of a comedic metal experience, which I think that's pretty funny in itself. Um, I think that's somewhat like what bro job is in the current yeah. deathcore scene. Um, yeah. Which I think they're having some issues because I know Screaming Mimi, uh, a, a decent friend and mentor of mine, he's uh, been touring with them until his oh. uh, band uh, kicks off. But uh, yeah, the, the the whole meme music is is kind of interesting that that's like a whole new genre within metal and especially within deathcore. Yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll be the first to say I, I I appreciate it for what it is, but like it's never been my thing personally. But it, it pretty much was come down to uh, starting a new project, having a new thing to work on, and helping out a friend. Um, even though it didn't work out, I mean, it, it did for me, <laughs> you know, yeah. but that specific yeah. project, you know, kind of fell apart real quick, but, uh, no, it's kind of funny. That's how this turned into what it is. You know, I would, I would say a lot of death core itself is sort of like, um, troll posting music. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, it, it yeah. definitely can be. Cause you got to yeah. think like we, you listen to say country music and it, and I guess broadly you're going to have like kind of the same type of, uh, lyrical themes, you know? Um, and then you look at, uh, like metal in general, like death core, death metal, the people are talking about whatever, you never know what you're going to get into with, with the new band, you know, which is really cool. Cause you can like one of my favorite bands is, uh, Eskimo cowboy. Um, who's now electric cowboy for whatever reason, but, uh, like their first few albums, it, it was like love songs to just like trashy party songs, you know, I, that I, I'd love that, you know, and some of it was actually funny to be fair, but, uh, I'm not against comedy. Comedy is my, my favorite thing next to music, you know? So I, I do like comedy, but you, it, I feel like a lot of the comedy music that I've heard in my life has not always hit that hard you know yeah i i think i've seen a few blue man group things i i think i feel like it's more for like uh weird like the weird owl that's what i think when i think comedy metal yeah. is like weird owl um yeah. which in his own respect is a great artist because oh to, yeah to to take and turn the songs and turn them into tropes and and to use the same rhythm and words and and still make it it takes still a lot same amount of work so yeah to this day white and nerdy is a masterpiece oh you know? <laughs> <laughs> and in fact i would argue more that when people are thinking of that song they're thinking of weird owl instead of yeah the actual, yeah and that and it, song it takes, and that, that yeah it stuff. takes a special kind of thing if if that's how it ends up you know uh, uh, I want to go see it. Um, I'm probably gonna have to watch it on stream, but, uh, Daniel Radcliffe was actually starring as uh weird owl, um, for his biopic. And it was, did funny that come out? I think it did because, uh, I, was gonna say, I saw something about it like a year ago and I forgot about it. Yeah. He, uh, he actually ended up doing Christmas photos for weird owl. Cause he does photos <laughs> and he weird owl, um, Daniel Radcliffe, was in the garb and like the costume for weird owl and, and okay. his christmas 
Christmas photos trolling. And I think Weird Al went to Daniel Radcliffe's Christmas photos and pretended to dress like Daniel Radcliffe. That's awesome. So, uh, Very wholesome I, stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, that's something in the, the the metal community that I feel... I'm not saying that there aren't Satanist bands because let's be real. There are, we oh, yeah. name them on, they're very obtuse. Um, the real thing is those that aren't Satanist. Those are the real deceivers. Um, but most of the metal communities is the, the, the hate of we're all Satanist is just really annoying. And I think it's by one brain cell Christians who can't comprehend nuance. Yeah. They, they oh, just yeah. hear the and they're like, oh, <laughs> Satanist. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, I will say, in my experience, I haven't run into that a lot. And I th- I'm 25 years old, so yeah. I guess I'm kind of experiencing it. Could, it could also be my area, too. There, I've, don't get me wrong. It, my music is not for everybody. And I'm, you know, if I introduce my music to like a coworker or somebody that doesn't listen to metal and they know me personally, like, I'm always ready for a, yo, this sucks, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, I've noticed as time goes on, uh, like for example, the, uh, I was handing out, uh, CDs at my job because you, you'd be talking about that stuff and they're like, Oh, you print CDs. Let me get one. You know, they've never heard anything like what I make, you know? And there's this one lady, I'm not going to say her name or anything, but she's 62 years old. Coolest lady. And she, she took my extraction and my deception album and she come back the the next week we worked and she loved it you know and she she's never heard anything like that before and she she like she gave me a full review you know like she understood it she she understood like everything that was going on and i feel like you know had it been 20 years ago i wouldn't have got gotten responses like that from people that never heard the music before you know what i mean I feel like we're at a turning point where people are more open to different things, you know, which is, which is good sometimes, you know, it's, uh, it's, I I think it's, uh, very interesting times because things that were overtly, um, let's, I don't want to use cliche terms, um, wicked versus righteous have kind of flipped, you know, and that's matching with what we see in the new Testament of, you know, in the last days, things that are holy will be called wicked and things that are wicked will be called holy. Um, and it's, it's interesting, but yeah, uh, that's kind of, that's really cool. I think I love seeing when old people get into new things because they always say you can't train an old dog, new tricks, but there are some quote old dogs out there that are willing to, um, do tricks. I don't know if you're a car guy. Um, but I saw a souped out uh, Subaru um, Technica. So it's like the STI top of the model, brand new, had BBS wheels, a uh, fat Tomei um, titanium three inch exhaust, which is like, I think $2,800 alone. Right. Um, it was turboed and like um, had a f- front mounted intercooler. Everything was on there. Really nice, slick tires on. Um, Recaro seats and everything in a sound system. And I was like, wow. And in my mind, I was prepping for, you know, somebody our age to like walk out right. into the car. Yeah. And it was a chick and it was like a, a, a lady in her late sixties walks over, gets in the car, drives away and just dumps the turbo the entire way up the street. And I'm yeah. just whole, I'm like, what? That's so, how, it, that's how it goes now, man. Uh, for sure. Uh, new, we're in a new era so i, I for sure it. so that's that's cool that she she gave that shows a lot of about her character as well that right. um, you gave her something and she actually went and listened to it because i don't know if you've been in that experience where people hand you like mixtapes and walmart parking lot and you're just like okay yeah um, yeah but that she actually went home played it listened to it and then wanted to talk to you about it that's that's awesome yeah it, w- it was it was fantastic and uh I'm really appreciative of that. Um, but also from a musician point of view, like if someone's giving me a mixtape, I'm going to listen to it. Cause I'm going to be thinking, well, I'm that guy, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but like, if I wasn't a musician, I don't even know. It, and like I said earlier, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to, to, you know, how, when your product is say a podcast or uh, music or anything like that, 
uh, it's just, it's just a hard thing to, to push, I guess. You know what I mean? You you're selling yourself. I would say there's a difference in music because while music is a reflection of you as an individual, it's not really you. It, it yeah. can be, it's like a, it's almost like a, you're Bruce Wayne and your music is Batman, right? So yeah. you can yeah. be completely disconnected from that. Um, but 100%. For, for me in my instance, you know, for my podcast side, um, people don't like me or like what I have to say or the guests I have on, I'm not going to get listened to. Um, right. Whereas in music, somebody may give somebody a chance. Um, I've listened to a ton of Dirty South mixtapes just because, you know, everyone's hand them out. I've, I've <laughs> yeah. listened to a ton of Southern deep. Um, I, I can't remember the genre of it, but there was like a sub genre that was just, you know, they'd play them in their cars you have like the megaphone on the front of this lifted crown Vic on fifties and it's blasting, you know, the producer tag label 500 times. And then it gives you the, the beat of whoever. Gotta love it. So um, <laughs> it, that's a whole experience in itself. And I'm, I'm tempted to move back to the U S and that's how I, I want to promote my band as well. I, I feel yeah. like that would be. No, that's um, awesome. Rolling death core. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I need to get a producer tag. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> broken curfew records <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um but yeah it's it's different because the end of the day you are selling stuff and then um some some people generally do like it so uh yeah a, which a is big, crazy <laughs> and crazy. i think your album is being very well received um so far I, i'm surprised because like when i dropped extraction at the time i was like now mind you i don't i don't live from a very like ego centric maybe that's the word like mm -hmm. I, I don't i don't feed my ego you know i'm no more important than the next guy so uh i'm over here like well w extraction personally to me was like the album like i don't know how i'm gonna top this type deal and uh pretty much with deception i i everything after after a few months went by with uh extraction being out i was like all right i don't like this i don't like this i don't like this because you're your own worst critic 100 percent of the time you know mm -hmm. um but when i made a de uh, deception i was like okay i want to do i want to make this album with nothing that i disliked about extraction if that makes sense and uh, so far i feel like that that did me well you know I paid a lot of attention to the last release when before I was just kind of powering through writing new stuff, trying to get better with writing, you know? And and since you're doing it from a one man perspective, it's really hard to have the criticism that you need to grow necessary. And there's a synergy when you have multiple people in a room, oh, yeah. you're playing through riffs. Um, but also on the flip side, I don't know if you are familiar with the band Coheed and Cambria. Um, yeah. They're, to me, their greatest song ever will be Welcome Home, just because it's uh, it was important to me at the time when it came out. But he wrote that on the floor of his kitchen with a giant metal bowl of cereal. And he was by himself and he just wrote he wrote the chord and riffs and was just playing with his story and element, uh, his uh, sort of uh, world building with it. So it was really, yeah. really good. So I'm not. It's not to say that you can't make great music by yourself because you've proved that. Um, I don't want to discuss it just quite yet. I want to kind of build the the conversation a bit more. But okay, um, uh, you have uh, a Facebook post that I was really shocked about. Um, okay, I think that's really cool. Um, In a good way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay, uh, I kind of want to talk more about. Uh, uh, so, glay so you you were talking about orange band fell through your homie said mm, okay on to other other pastures and you're you're left with this music you've made the song unblinded you really want to do something so where does glay come from how does that enter into um so as far as the name goes uh i stuck with it from i i had a rune an old school runescape clan that was pretty big you know it was uh -huh. a community of us that was i don't know if you're familiar with runescape if not yeah. congratulations uh <laughs> if so i'm sorry but 
but uh no i had this clan and my my screen name was my last name glacier and uh it was it was a big community of people that i'd always be playing with always talking to because at the time i was a security guard so when i was at work i was playing runescape you know um but people called me glay for short and it kind of you know to this day those same friends that i uh that i made playing runescape and talk to every day still like on a personal level um they still call me glay and it's really funny but when i made this solo project i was like okay orange man is not happening um what should i call it and i was like glay because it's me (laughs) you know but uh that's as far as the name goes but as far as like the music um in travesty of mankind i was making music and writing lyrics that i always would look back on with disgust you know like it did not represent what i wanted to look back and see myself as if that makes sense um Mm -hmm. it came from all an authentic viewpoint but i also grew up a lot since i was writing for travesty you know i was in the drugs and you know just just anything that's bad for me type stuff so um when when i kind of started taking christianity more seriously um because i i had always been a christian you know and it was always weird because like in travesty i'd have a song about my faith and the next song about uh partying you know just stuff like that and Uh it just it wasn't good on on many levels it just wasn't good um so when i did started glay i was like this is gonna be like a I'm going to express myself in this way because it's not, uh, well, I know it's not bad for me. It's how I feel. And I want to be able to look back and be like, that's not absolutely horrible. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I, I mean, obviously I am passionate about my beliefs, you know? So that that's kind of where the lyrical stuff comes from, but also it's a good, uh, projection of how I view the world. Um, more so in a cryptic sense. I'm not really on the nose with a lot of things, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I know this world is messed up, <laughs> you know? So, uh, that, that, that and Jesus pretty much is what, what got me going lyrically with Glay. Um, so I see that 2021 is when you posted music do you feel like what happened through the events of covid19 also influenced um pushing out music or was that just uh uh, circumstance circumstance 100 percent. okay um i'm in the state of north carolina and every state um and every city in our country uh handled covid very differently um for me I was considered an essential worker, right? So Mm -hmm. I was a security guard for the company that I actually work for now. So the whole time that COVID was going on, it was just me because I was in the guardhouse by myself every shift. So it was like you'd switch out guards and that was the most interaction you'd get face to face with somebody. So I never, I, I personally was seeing everything from the outside in with COVID Um, because like I said, I didn't, I didn't lose my job. I didn't get laid off. I didn't, which is really unfortunate for the people that did that. That's horrible, you know? Um, but luckily, like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't have to do a lot of things. Other people did put it that way, you know? So, uh, I, I kinda, I, I, I will say that COVID had zero, uh, influence on what I was doing at the time and to this day, really. It's just kind of something that was happening around me, if that makes sense. Okay. Not to sound insensitive either, you know. No, I, I understand. Um, so you're working these guard shifts. Do you feel like that that solitude kind of was what you needed to to think through these things? Or did you spend any amount of oh, 100%. time? 100%. See, that's when I started uh, actually diving into the word, you know. Um, it's always been uh, like few verses ponder on that type of stuff like i didn't i wasn't super passionate about it like as a teenager i guess Uh, just Mm -hmm. being honest like i believed this this and this but it wasn't like i wasn't ready to uh argue for it or you know like make points i guess uh if that makes sense but 
being being in that guard shack for 40 hours a week um you know you can only play so much video games <laughs> you know what i mean uh so i i was i started like actually reading the bible um which to this day i notice a lot of people don't admit they don't do because i hear some of the craziest claims about christianity in the bible and it's like you obviously have no idea what this is about and uh i basically was trying not to be that person you know um mm. i didn't want to be ignorant of what i knew little about but cared about you know uh seeds were planted and i i guess the the plant started to grow at that point in my life um and being alone and all that uh really sparked it up you know and then also like i would i started record like those first uh the first uh single uh fruits of the spirit and set free were if i remember correct i'm not sure on set free but i think i know for a fact fruits of the spirit um was all recorded in the guard shack you know so i could just bring my guitar to work no one cared they just wanted me to be awake you know <laughs> that, that's pretty much how it went so i took advantage of that you know and then i got familiar with reaper because uh prior to that i was using uh I had this old MacBook Pro that I was using GarageBand and Logic to do music with. So I, uh, at the time, didn't have my own computer. So my girlfriend, now wife, um, lent me her computer to use at the Guard Shack, and it was a Windows computer, you know? So I was like, all right, what can I do to make music now? And uh, I started using Reaper, and I still use it to this day. But, uh, yeah, it's just a lot of learning and actually doing stuff and having the time to do it, you know. So that's what I've become appreciative about because I, I kind of similarly jumped into deciding, you know, I want to do some deathcore vocals myself. And then um, I was sitting in the sauna one day and I feel like when you're in the sauna or you're doing something miserable, the natural man of you that just wants to be wicked all the time is distracted by not trying to die. Um, and so you can have like a really strong spiritual moments where the spirit can talk to you. And I felt very inclined to write about some of my mental health and struggles. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and I just ended up writing a ton of songs that I'm technically still working through and there's tons of unreleased stuff. And I'm currently going through the whole process and there's so much involved in making music. It's not as simple as, you know, just going and recording a song, not to say you can't do that, but right. there's, there's a lot of aspects and um, I've kind of, I'm, I'm very nerdy by nature. And so like knowing the technical aspects and I'm always asking artists like, Hey, how, what, what was your mix and plugin chain? If you don't mind, <laughs> um, I'm curious right, how, right, how right. you did the spe spe specifics. And so um, I think it's cool that you're using Reaper. Um, I didn't find out about it um, until like I'm already invested in other, <laughs> other stuff. So I'm like, mm. right. Uh, a little late on my part, but that that's cool. That sound that's like, if you ever get to do like a little movie, if you ever get big enough to have a movie that the guard shack scene will definitely set up the tone. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's very, Oh yeah. That's first act right there. Oh yeah. And you, I can even see it in my head of like this montage of you just like showing up at the guard shack, doing the hello, seeing what's going on, making your rounds, and then just wanting to go back and just strum away on the guitar. And that, that, that's that's really pretty cool. much how it went, man. That really is. Uh, intermittent break for some ramen or <laughs> whatever the, yeah. the night's meal <laughs> yeah. was. <laughs> get a Coke and get back to it. Yeah, that, I mean that that's that's pretty spot on. That's how it was, man. It was it was it was as boring as you made it, and as as interesting as you could make it, you know. Yeah, in the military, I've actually had to do guard mount like that before, and um, in the Middle East, uh, sometimes like the AC would cut out, or it it would just be like it would be so cold you'd want to sit outside in the the heat to like warm up because of how it was just different. Um, yeah, man. I can imagine it's different, different life, but, uh, let's see. Um, so the, the elements in the latest, latest song are just really all over the place. And I don't want to sound rude about that, but that that's my take. It's like, but at the same time, 
it flows together to where if you zoom out and you look at all of your tracks on deception, they work. Um, and it, it kind well, of you. tells a story in a very unique way. Yeah, um, when I write a song for an album, I'm trying to create a full experience in each song, you know. And I like crazy music. Like I I like uh, you know, like Scaring the Hose with Danny Brown and JPEG and then like Death Grips, like just really absolutely insane sounding stuff. And, uh, I like, and, and, you know, metal's already kind of crazy, you know? So, uh, I like to include a lot of like, just weird stuff that, that pop in my mind. You know, I like weird noises. I like, I like hearing music that will almost scare you the first time you hear it. Cause you don't understand what you just heard. You know, <laughs> like if that makes any sense, uh, that's kind of like my draw. I like crazy stuff. It's a, it's an auditory experience listening through the album. And for those well, that, that haven't listened to it, I would highly suggest you turn off that uh, shuffle mode on your streaming platform of choice and listen to tracks one through, was it 12? I want to say it's one through 12. Yeah, it, it's one through 12. The 13th song um, is Butterfly, which is a cover of a grime song, which was for me. So a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I really liked Butterfly. That was like the most unique cut off of the album and i'm like yeah you know that was a cover of a pop song right <laughs> you know but uh yeah so i i will say it's 12 we'll say it's 12 because like yeah, on spotify and everything it's 12 but on the cd it's it, uh, there's a 13th yeah. yeah um the album artwork uh whoever did that i props to them it's it's visually catching for all of them actually it's it's uh it's a stunning piece to look at and it's very Ezekiel. I like the psyop single and the glay itself is very, well, I could, uh, I could uh, tell you all about it. Ezekiel and, uh, um, Jeremiah. Yeah. Um, so with, da, 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 um, uh, if you don't mind, I, I'm going to go through all the releases. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> Um, oh, so, I do want to comment on the yeah. Deception solo as well. That reminds me of some like Deftone covers that I, um, I've i seen where it's just like this uh, collage. It's really great. I love Deftones. My, my wife introduced me to them. Absolutely love Deftones. Deftones is awesome. Um, but as far as the album or the album art goes, uh, the Fruits of the Spirit and Set Free were done by uh, a good good friend named uh, Josiah Adkins. He's uh, pretty active in the Christian metal community. And then um, Unblinded and Flesh Cycle, I made myself, you know. And then Extraction was this dude named Michael Alarov or something. It, it was a very Russian last name. I, I bought it online. And then same with Deception. It was this, uh, I don't know the name of the person. But their page on Instagram is Design Your Euphoria. And uh, mm. I was just going through the website that uh, I found the extraction art to. And uh, I found that. And I was like, this is cool. This is, I, I feel like I can really, I can work with this, you know. But I appreciate it, man. Uh, I, I'm trying to like get the best art I can, you know. Because uh, the truth of it is, is if you have nice art, it's going to draw more people in, you know, but, uh, 100%. the deception single and the psyop single are, were done by, uh, Seth over at broken curfew. Cause like when I, when I signed with broken curfew, I had deception finished with the art mixed mastered everything. Um, so he was like, okay, we'll do that. But like from now on, like I can do your art, you know? Um, and he does fantastic work on uh digital art. It, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's responsible for the deception and psyop single art too. I think that's an aspect that, um, I'm more excited for, uh, for doing new music is the album art. Um, I, for, for, uh, a type in shadow, uh, for my demo album art, mm. it, 
it was like a rough draft and I found an artist on Fiverr and said, this is what I have sketched out. I'd, I'd like to see it more. Um, Bring it to I, life. I, yeah. Um, I do watercolors. I, I am an artist. I just, I don't have the digital skill and I, I wanted that, that cleanness that digital art has that yeah. pops more because to do it in um, physical media, it takes a lot of time. So. Um, oh yeah. It definitely does. But yeah, the the broken curfew records are just just stunning. Um, oh yeah, man, it it blows uh, anything I could do out of the water. And like I I'm I'm okay with graphic design stuff, uh, but everything I've made, like for Travesty, my my last band, um, that I really don't like to dwell on because I really don't I don't want to advertise that stuff at all. But uh, I made I made the album art for all those, and at the time it was cool. But like looking back, it's like I've got a lot of criticism. Like, hey, you should pay someone to do your art. <laughs> and at the time, I was like, no, <laughs> no, you know. So I kind of that was part of my uh, growing up with the music stuff. Is like I, I kind of had to realize that okay, maybe I can't do everything, you know, uh, when it comes to like on a promotion level, you know, because that that's what a lot of album art is. Is like like I said it draws people in so it, it does play a giant role in when you promote your music because that's what people are going to see that's pretty much the face of it you know but uh no dude seth seth is great at what he does and I, on the next album uh he's definitely going to be uh designing that I, that that's uh um something i've i've heard from several people about broken curfews uh they're their uh what's the term their their uh employees i guess uh mm -hmm. the best way to say it they have a a very talented showcase to really set stuff up and yeah the and way they well. uh they uh what's the word they operate uh, uh the the way they present the way they present mm. everything is yeah. wonderful you know like it's top of the line in my opinion and um, I would say in the Christian music community right now, they're they're one of the better record uh, labels out there. That you can yeah, I mean, honestly, being part of it, I was so sketched. You know, I'm not going to go into my deal or anything, but yeah, uh, no, no, you know, I, I was so sketched. And when he sent me the contract, I was like, this is the answer to my prayers, you know, because like uh, there was two other labels I was talking to. And I had the cho I was trying to choose in between one or the other, um, more, more popular labels, put it that way. And, uh, then I, I didn't know which to, what to do. I prayed about it a bunch and, uh, out of nowhere, Chris Olson, uh, Seth's buddy starts talking to me, you know, one night I'm at work cause you know, I work night shift. So in the middle of the night, someone texts me, I'm like, okay, what's happening? You know? And he's talking about how much you like the uh, extraction and everything. And I'm like, thanks. And he's like, yeah, you should uh, consider, um, this broken curfew label and obviously it was brand new so it's like okay i've done this before like i've done the whole i've been part of two other labels with my old band that were brand new they got a little bit of traction and then just dropped off the face of the planet you know so i was like if and i you know i had this conversation with him i was like if this is here to stay i'm willing to try again if <laughs> you know what i mean and so far it's been fantastic like i have zero complaints it couldn't have worked out better, but he came out of left field and that ended up being the right choice, you know? So. Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit interesting. I feel like in the music scene, it can be very easy for somebody to be caught up in, um, somebody that's not a legit label or these things that are called hybrid labels, um, and that somebody could be doing, you know, they're not getting as much out of it. Um, I've had, I've had a few reach out trying to, to sign me and it, right. it's like, uh, from what I see, I'm paying you a lot of money and there's very little guarantee here on my, yeah. on my part. And I'm like, mm. it's like, I'm already <laughs> spending money on my own promotion. That was yeah. mainly what it was. I was like, uh, one of the yeah. things I wanted to do different from extraction was like just the way I approached promotion um 
because like in all honesty I, I don't see it all as numbers you know doesn't really that that's not what i'm doing this for but uh it does help i'll put it that way it definitely does help you see like for me it's like okay people are listening to this that's awesome it's working you know but being a one-man project and then having to promote all the time it started to burn me out a little bit because i was like i just want to stop you know i just want to make music you know i don't want to have to do all this extra stuff so uh, that's why i wanted to find a a label because at first i was totally against labels you know i was like they're pretty much just banking on what you're working on essentially and uh Honestly, that has not been the experience uh, with Broken Curfew at all. Um, that's good to know. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you? Let's see. Sorry, I was I good. was reading something. I'm trying to keep all my notes in my head in order for to have a decent conversation. <laughs> You're good, man. <laughs> it's hard. So far, so good. <laughs> um. Now, some of these I'm, I'm really good at impromptu stuff, but I just want to make sure I, I address something. And, uh, I, I don't know if you saw some of the previous episodes. I've, I've spoken with Searching Serenity. So Robert Manzone, uh, and, um, the episode 14 was with Alter Heart, which was really great. Um, sure. okay. he actually sent me Haze to listen to before the podcast. Um, and it wasn't even dropped yet. So I was like, oh, that's oh. awesome. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and then that was super pumped. And I just did an episode before, but the, the last two back to backs were all music. So um, I'm like, Oh no, I'm turning into a music podcast, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, it's okay. I, I like, I'm, I'm selfish. It's it, I'm, I'm talking to people I want to talk to. So it's really cool. Cause when you go to concerts and stuff, you don't really have the opportunity to really have conversations with artists because there's a line of 200 and you know, it's like 30 seconds, shake, sh uh, shake hands, greet, sign stuff and walk away. If you get that opportunity, yeah. uh, if, if you get that, I think my funnest memory is uh, not to sidetrack, but it was a flogging Molly concert in Salt Lake at the uh, venue in the venue. And at the end of the show, they're like, we're going to go get drunk and get street tacos outside. You're all welcome to join. And so there was like 300 people in the streets getting street tacos, just destroying that street taco vendors uh, supply. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, interesting things. And I've had some off the hand conversations with um, uh, the color morale. We were talking okay. about corgis uh, and uh, the breed, of, breed of dog. And then um, I was talking with John the Butcher of the last 10 seconds of life. And then I got a text message that there's a blizzard incoming and I need to get out of there fast <laughs> and you can <laughs> drive home. So um, I had to cut the conversation short, but yeah, it's just, it's real interesting. Um, yeah. This is definitely a different kind of sphere as far as uh, the social aspect goes, you know, cause you know, when you're, when you're out there playing a show, you're, you're getting up there, you're playing, you're getting off, you know, and then it's on to the next, you know? Yeah. Um, the, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to mess this up. I'm going to look them up on spot. I have the Spotify pulled up real, real quick. Um, Christian Deathcore new releases. Um, the yeah. individual that runs that page is really amazing. Um, he, I reached out. I was like, Hey man, will you listen to my, some of my songs? And he provided some brutally honest feedback, which a, I know I need. Um, but he took time enough to give the feedback similar to the lady at your church that, or at your work that did that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. You and need, it's, you it's always a feedback. blessing to run into those people that are willing to, you know, even do that. Um, I know for me, I've, I've had luck with, uh, TikTok, there's a big music community on TikTok for live song reviews. I think it's become a point now where it's like um, smaller artists are doing song reviews and in between song reviews, they play their own songs to generate, you know, fan base for their own music and then giving stuff. Uh, a couple of my favorite study shows and G Trill, um, they have a lot of streams. I think study shows is my favorite because uh, they've been mixing for a band called Mara Jade. If you're a nerd, you'll know Mara Jade in the canon of Star Wars was Luke Skywalker's wife. Um, oh, really? 
Yeah, she was a redheaded uh, assassin of Darth Vader, and he sent her after um, Luke Skywalker, and he didn't know that Luke Skywalker had that dog in him, and um, uh, <laughs> she, she traded sides quickly. So, oh, that's awesome. Um, but Marty, that I did not know. I'm very familiar with Star Wars, though. I yeah, do like I'll, I'll shoot you the link for Mara Jade. I think you'll like it. They they have a lot of stuff. They just did a cover for the Scooby Doo song recently, which was really fun. So, okay. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of different communities. I f- I feel like this new we're in a new era, and I like it. Um, not to rehash what I said on previous episodes, but in the old days, if you wanted to get big, you had to hope for Sony Records or Atlantic or somebody to hear you. Yeah, and you'd essentially have to sell your soul to get there. Yeah. You know, like it, you take you change your whole life, and meanwhile, me and you can just you know do it as a hobby almost, and then go from there. You know, exactly. Uh, where if you wanted to put time and commitment into it, you can. Um, my vocal coach is David uh, Benitez. Uh, if you've heard of Extreme Vocal Institute, he started that during COVID. Um, it weird synergy of like COVID happened, his music kind of died down. Um, and so he built this base of like, Hey, I have the, I have decade, almost two decades of music experience and lessons and, and can really get in depth. And so he created the Academy as a, or the Institute as a way to teach people how to scream responsibly. Um, he's the one that started that hashtag and, um, okay. and following him. And then along the way, he started dropping teasers about like, Hey, I have my own music. And so it's, it, it's really great. Um, the way things are working because it's not some dude in a suit deciding what song is good. It's legitimately the people. If the people it's the like source. It. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's awesome. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I've thought about doing auxiliary things you know um and then circling it back around to uh hey i also have music (laughs) you know (laughs) and you can't be ashamed because if you really believe in what you believe in and that you feel like this is uh something that god wants you to do to bring a message of christ and and salvation to people in the gospel in a uh an avant-garde way um it it's part of the process so Oh yeah. Uh, you're you're doing it and um it's really exciting to see how how much do you sit there when you're planning your music or your songwriting? Is it like is your daily devotion influencing your music or is it just kind of like a eureka moment or are you intentionally going and like wanting to translate certain passages into a song? Um It's kind of weird. I, it's kind of a mixture of all of that, to be honest with you. I, uh, I'll, I'll start writing lyrics separately from the instrumentals. Like when I, when I do a project, I, uh, do the instrumentals first for the most part. And then I'll listen to my demos, you know, and then put my, you know, lyrics to it. And the way I do it is kind of like, sometimes it's very personal. And then other times it's like straight out of the Bible, you know, what I'm reading. And then I'm writing about that. Cause like, I, okay. For example, I love for today, but they're like super on the nose, like straight out of the Bible stuff, which I love, you know, but that, that's not what I, what I do. And, uh, I wouldn't say that I make necessarily like Gen- not generic like stereotypical worship music you know mm, yeah. um i have like uh a better place off of deception uh i would say is like a legitimate full-on worship song um but uh no it's usually like well i i apply the bible to my life a lot you know um as i believe i should and uh a lot of it comes from there but that you you will you will hear some glaze songs that are like um not heavily you know based off of the bible i guess but it's from a christian view if that makes sense um i i guess yeah you know what i mean like but like i said there's some other songs that are like straight out straight out of what i'm reading at that point in time and then other things it's like 
I'm writing about this. Let me look up references in the Bible to similar situations and kind of feed off of that back and forth. You know what I mean? Because I, I believe the Bible is the truth, you know, so you can't really go wrong with the truth. Um, that, that's a really good way to do it. <laughs> well, thank um, you. So far it's working, <laughs> or at least I'd like to think so. <laughs> so when you're looking at deception, um, there's 12, uh, oh, <laughs> 10 songs. Spotify is slowly deleting songs. <laughs> It's only showing me 10 right now. Yeah, it'll um, show you the top 10 most uh, yeah. listened to. Oh, uh, it's so silly how they do stuff. It, it, it is. Really hard. It, it really is. Because like before uh, Deception came out, it was a mixture of all different releases that you'd see. But since Deception just came out this month, that's what people have been listening to the most in the past 28 days or whatever. So give it, give it two months and you'll probably see some stuff from Extraction pop back up there. Uh, for, uh, uh, was it proclaim the sky posted something and I was on their Spotify and I'm like, that's weird because <laughs> the Spotify screenshot says, shows it's all over the place. Like their number two song had like 2000 more streams than the number one song. I'm like, I don't know what Spotify is doing. I think that yeah, I tell you what I fit with, I, I think it was you that asked that on the post, right? Yeah, it was, it was, it was. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I figured out it was because of the last 20, because I looked into it. I was like, why is that? And it, it's because of pretty much that. It's just the most popular, you know, the last yeah. month, essentially. Um, so which I guess song, makes sense, you know. While a song could technically have more streams, it's not what is the most popular. So I'm like, yeah. they're they're being literal and I'm not being literal. So I feel stupid. Right, right. <laughs> No, I, I understand completely. <laughs> when they said popular, they meant popular. <laughs> yeah, they meant like right now. <laughs> yeah, not <laughs> most, most played um, uh, different words <laughs> using yeah. English. Because uh, see, I have uh, I have over uh, 10 songs with over a thousand plays, right? So like I'm used to looking at it and it'd be like, you can see the amount of plays that it has next to every song on the popular but it's not like that right now you can only see psyop and deception and then the rest of them haven't hit a thousand yet because if anyone doesn't know that's how it works on spotify if there's not a view count or play count whatever you want to call it next to the song it's because there's under a thousand and so, they're just not going to track it yeah or, it's not or, it's not going to show up until you get there for whatever reason i, I really don't know why and, like and, imagine looking at youtube and then it's like no views <laughs> till you get a thousand and it's like what <laughs> you know um mine i'm pretty positive says less than a thousand i'm like would you stop <laughs> See, it, you know what mine did that for a little bit too but yeah it has the less less than symbol thing and oh, then, now i now that i said that i went and looked on the discord or the uh the spotify discography and it's there's no less than a thousand. So I guess my song's not even being played. That's okay. Fine. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, they might've changed that because they, like, yeah, I'm not seeing that either. They're so silly. They're, they're really silly. I think a lot of it comes into a play. You have an international company and then you have each country with their own rules of what can be played. Like yeah. there's stuff that's available. I remember this is really dumb of me, but when I was a kid watching Disney, Beauty and the Beast, for some reason, was my favorite Disney movie. I watched it so much, I damaged the VHS tape. Okay. So anytime there's like a, a different telling of Beauty and the Beast, I watch it. And there was a French version that was one of the biggest productions at the time for a live action telling of it. I wanted to watch it so bad, but it was only available on French Apple and so that's so weird that I, is so weird i had to go and find a place that would make me allow me to make a french email account to then log on to using a vpn into france to log on to apple to watch this like hour and 40 minute music but um, was it good it was it was worth it was worth it i think it's actually good like deal. two hours um awesome. but yeah it's it's so silly that and um being overseas like in the middle east middle east youtube is so weird um you could have like you have these like uh videos where it's um islamic 
uh, sheikhs, which are scholars, you know, preaching um, the Quran and, you know, the fire and brimstone of Islam, and then inter- interrupt to a Indian Bollywood movie. And then it right. next video that plays is straight up porn. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very different. <laughs> so yeah. it's just so silly that we can't just have a a free internet that regardless of where you're at, you can go look at it. So, yeah. And, uh, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't have an opinion on that as much. Um, granted it, it, I'm sure it reflects the culture, you know, um, see it um, like you, you, I would assume so. Right. Yeah. It's just like, it, I think that's more so of society. Yeah. Where we're at right now. Um, but it's just weird. And then at the same time, they're like, stop pirating our stuff. And it's like, well, in order to watch everything on every one of these streaming channels, I think the recent math is like $230 is what it would cost you to watch one episode that's exclusive to a specific streaming platform. And so it was like the top 10 most streamed episodes are all in 10 different platforms. And it's going to cost you nearly $300 to watch them all. Yeah, that's and that's then they're insane. like, it's it, we we've gone back to cable TV while music is progressing. Um, <laughs> uh, video media is digressing. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. And and you know what? I'm a big uh, I'm a big YouTube guy. You know, I really like uh, stand up and all that. And you can find that all on YouTube. You know, but uh, I I don't know. I've tried with the Paramount and. Like HBO is great. I really liked The Sopranos. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. That was on HBO. You know, I used HBO for that. Uh, once upon a time, I had Disney Plus, where I watched like The Mandalorian and the newer Star Wars stuff, which I'm falling behind very heavily on. I think there's like three series that I haven't seen yet, um, or two or something. I watched Boba Fett and Mandalorian. That's besides the point, though. Um, <laughs> my daily watch is YouTube though. So I can imagine being in a different, uh, country and it's just completely different. You know, um, I've been living in Japan when I move next year will be a total of seven years. And the amount of Japanese ads I've, I've had to watch oh, man. since being over here or the, my frustration will be like, I'll log into Google and it defaults to Japanese. And it's like, I've eventually like learned them. to read the kanji of what is <laughs> change language. Cause yeah, right, like, right. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then for some reason, the Google web translate is decided it's taking a coffee break, so it can't help you out. And so you have to figure stuff out. So yeah, that, um, that's wild. What is it like? If, if I'm not trying to like trail off too hard on your oh, no worries. here, but uh, I would, how do you feel about Japan? You said you're in Japan right now. Yeah. Um, I've been, I'm in the United States air force and, uh, um, I've been in Japan for six years. Um, That's awesome. I was really enjoying it until COVID, um, because of COVID and my, um, marriage and trying to be with my wife, I, I haven't stepped foot on us soil in four years. Oh um, man. And so that's kind of been a hard aspect until COVID hit. It's, it's been really great. It really sucks being so far away. It's at least, uh, from here to Seattle is a 16 hour, um, flight. Oh man. Okay. And, that, and that's once you're in Tokyo and from here to Tokyo is three hours. So you're in the sky for almost 20 hours. Um, yeah. That's wild. And it's brutal. And there's a whole bunch of things. And, um, Oh, I can imagine COVID was a big deal over there. Cause, uh, th- I've seen pictures of Tokyo and yeah. oh my gosh, that is the biggest city I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> that's it, insane. So I can imagine it's very dense, densely populated. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to go into it too much because Spotify will do that whole like misinformation thing, but oh, I um, got you. It, it's a fact, but one of the cruise ships were with the original infections from wherever they came from landed uh-huh. in the port here on Okinawa. So we were getting it before everybody else was getting it. Oh my so, gosh. Um, yeah. It was and great. I, and so you were, you Good were time. there for it. Yeah. Very, oh, very different time. So now it's kind of back to normal. Um, people were wearing masks in Japan. It's more of an Asian thing where if they feel sick, they won't stay home, but they'll put on a uh, surgical mask and go out. And so part of their deal is to. like yeah. masks weren't new for them. No, no, it was, um, 
what was kind of new was putting up like transparent film for the cashier, different rules or limiting how many people could be in um, right. restaurants and stuff. But at the same time, I think it helped democratize things and limited something Japan has really excelled ever since Western nations have started coming over here. And the, the, I want to say the 1600s is they really adopted bureaucracy and, and nobody yeah. does bureaucracy like Japan. And so a lot of the stuff that happened basically allowed them to kind of like push this bureaucracy into streamlining. So some things are easier, like car registration. Um, you have to do it every year um, for insurance has just made it easier. But um, I've, I've enjoyed living over here and there's just so much cool history um, uh, where I'm at on Okinawa. Um, it, they it dates back to the Neolithic period. Like that's how long people okay. have lived on this island. Oh man, um, it, it it's really awesome. It's called the Ryuku Islands, which in Japanese means dragon chain or the dragon islands, and uh, it's just really really cool culture and uh, a, a blend of it. And I mean, if you've seen the Karate Kid, um, they attempt to represent uh, Okinawa in that movie uh, by filming in Hawaii, but. Uh, um, um, they get a lot of the the <laughs> the, the, the places man. wrong. So, dude, th- this that's a small island. I just looked it up. Yeah, oh my uh, on my motorcycle, I can go from the middle of the island to the top of the island in th- just about two hours and thirty ish minutes. Oh man, that's that's awesome though. So, right. how's the weather? Do you ever run into too much water? Uh, yeah, <laughs> typhoon. Okay. <laughs> Typhoons oh man, are terrible. So, um, thankfully God's, uh, kept the worst from a while, uh, 2017. If you look this up, you'll find it crazy, but 2017 typhoon Okinawa, um, there's a spot called the seawall. The water was so high. It was coming up to the second floor of the apartment buildings. Cars oh were gosh. literally floating out to sea. It was insane. Um, power was out on the Island for up to seven days in some spots. It was, it was crazy. Um, but uh, something about the Jap- something that I've recognized and appreciate the Japanese, they, they're very community driven. And so anytime a storm comes through, you'll see everybody outside picking stuff up and getting everything to, you know, go back to normal. So that's, yeah. that's something that I've been able to really well, that's appreciate. Cool. So, yeah. Um, but I'm excited to go back to the U.S. Uh, Japan's cool, but um, it's not. Home. Of, yeah. 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 So, I, 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 I picked that up, man. And then, you know, that that's hard, but I mean, do you know how much longer? Uh, next year for sure. I, oh, um, okay. the way policies work, I'll, I'll, I'll be going there. So hopefully things get set up where we can go. I'm hoping Florida, uh, for, Ooh, Florida, yeah. for some personal reasons, but also that's where searching serenity is at. And I would just love to go. That is out true. Robert, so. it, yeah. It's much easier to find him. If you go there, <laughs> yeah. I, I've thought about doing it as well. He, he made this post the other day, uh, with his uh, Halloween decoration, I think it says uh, "Welcome" or something, oh, and I yeah. was like, "All right, I'm coming." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, he, Robert's awesome, and He's uh, great people. Yeah, he uh, he mixed and mastered extraction and deception. That's why it sounds good at cheeky. all. <laughs> he was so cheeky about it because he hinted to mixing some other people's stuff. So, oh. um, he's very humble too. Yeah, I'll have to I get like on. It. Yeah, he's a he's a wonderful guy. I, I I speak to him pretty regularly. He's a good guy. Um and if you want, I can send you the link to Alter Heart. He's a great guy as well. So um he, he's I, basically in the same boat. Y'all 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 would make a great band if you could get together. <laughs> y'all yeah, I, I, I hear that. <laughs> um in uh, between sets you could swap instruments or the mic. <laughs> you know, right. It's and play, speaking so. of, I'm actually uh so I'm in another band that I play drums in. It's like a interesting Southern rock rap type deal. You know, it's uh, very different than anything that I've written before. Um, but I, I just do the drums and I'll record bass and stuff. I'm not really like writing the music more so than like placing the drums, if that makes sense. Um, okay. And figuring out how they, cause he gives me full creative freedom to, you know, he, he, he trusts that I will do well, you know? So when we practice and stuff, I figure out what I'm doing. And lately we've been working on an album. Um, but well, where was I going with that? Oh, 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 one of the guitar players in the band, um, also likes deathcore. 
And, uh, oh, that's awesome. He, he's a good Christian guy and everything. He, he's really cool. Um, but he was open to learning some of my Glay music. So we're going to do like an old oh, I Set My Friends on Fire type deal where uh, me and him play to a drum track and I just do vocals and he does guitars and we just hope that it sounds good <laughs> and people like it. <laughs> I, I I felt so stupid when I asked this question because it was like I posted it to Facebook and immediately three seconds later there was a response and it it was a heavy one. It was on the um, metal vocalist community for Facebook. Oh yeah, and yeah. I was like, hey, I'm interested in doing live shows. I'm just the vocalist and songwriter. I don't really have anybody. And they're like, what are you trying to do? Karaoke of songs that nobody knows. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh, uh, wait, yeah. That's their opinions right. do not matter to me. <laughs> um, but no, for, I, I, I think, see what they're uh, saying, though. So yeah, it's um, totally a thing. But if you got the vibe, man, it's yeah. You know, I, I think it's possible. You know, there's a lot of people uh, that do one man stuff where, uh, like, uh, cemetery R word or uh, yeah, putrid pile. You know. Um, or Stuff street like street buskers will do that whole like live music where they'll pick up an instrument, play it. They have their MIDI control panel and they loop it. It's like it's funny that's, for deep. That's a whole different beast. That is yeah. insane. Like that's that stuff is awesome. Um, that's I'm talking that's not like, karaoke, but <laughs> that is not karaoke. <laughs> uh, I'm talking like guitar and vocal. It's just one guy on stage doing guitars and vocals playing to a drum track. And people eat that stuff up, you know? Mm. So that's pretty much what I'll be doing. Um, I think if you want to do that and you're in a place where you can experiment with it, I don't see the issue with it. I've seen it work before. Now, if it were up to me, it'd be nice to find a full band, but that's just not happening. If I, if I waited to find a full band, uh, by the time I'd find a drummer that could play my stuff, um, and wants to, you know, it's, that's not the, there's a lot of criteria that needs to be met and has to be willing to stick to it and actually get somewhere, you know, um, everyone else would already be clocked out because they, nothing would be going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. While you mentioned it, I kind of want to comment uh, back. I would say back in the day, the, the biggest thing that bands were missing was like a vocalist. Like nobody wanted to do vocals because it's one of the harder aspects of it. Or they were missing a bass player. And now it's like, it's flipped. Everyone has a vocalist and everyone has a bass player. And then people are like, hey, anybody want to play drums? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> where are the drummers? And that's exactly how I, uh, I've, I've played in a lot of bands in the past, just trying to, you know, meet new people and uh, see if I'm comfortable playing with, you know, said new people. And uh, it's been a lot of trial and error. I'm not going to lie. Um, but this, this last project that I started helping with, uh, uh, it's called Patty B, by the way. That's that's what it is. Um, and Patty B, it's been really awesome because you got to think. Uh, I, I'm 25. Uh, the guitar player and the vocalist and the secondary vocalist is uh, they're in their like mid 30s, you know. And then you got our bass player and our other guitar player who are like. 50 60 <laughs> you know it's really interesting but they are the coolest people man um i never thought i'd be in that type of get up you know um with with a band that i decided to play with you know because i've always focused on glay and my own stuff but like i want to get out there and play with other people still you know but it, so far this has been really good it's it's going on a year i think that i've been doing it um but we're finally putting together a product you know we're putting together this album it's it's been good but uh yeah as far as like that it's like you get such a mishmash of different types of people that play this music that's more commonly known and like popular and mainstream and then once you start looking into metal, like it's so hard to find musicians that can keep up, that want to do it, that can do it, and just them existing in general, you know, like it's so much. And it is metal is getting more popular as time goes on, but it's still not easy to find a bit, not in my area, at least. I know there's places around the US where like you can go to any venue and walk out meeting like 10 different new musicians, you know. But that's just not how it is over here. So I, I've taken what I can get. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
beggars can't be choosers, as they say. So that's right. Um, that's right. I think if it's right, if you are going to tour, I'm sure broken curfews, if you really were dead set on doing something local, at least in, within your state or. On oh, the, dude, the, Seth is going to be the guy. State, yeah, the they, Seth is going to be the guy I go free. to. And and if anything, I'm, I mean, the, the metal community could, you know, you reach out and like, hey, I'm going here. Can I get somebody to fill in or whatever? Um, here, here's this, here's the, here's the straight guitar instrumentals for you. Here's the, here's the wave. Here's the stem. Can you please learn yeah. this for me or whatever? And I'm yeah, sure and I've, I've definitely, I've definitely thought of doing that, but it's just so like, it's, it's, it, it can be potentially very like sketchy. It's a lot of unknown territory there. You know what I mean? Um, but as far as like booking shows and stuff, I feel like I could post about that. And they're like, yeah, you're serious. Okay. Come here. <laughs> you know, but I also, you know, I got a wife. I want to have kids. Um, I'm buying a house right now. I got a lot on my plate. I got a lot oh, yeah. that said that's uh, my roots are here. So when we get to the point where we want to play shows, we're going to do like house shows and uh, smaller venue stuff. And then if we ever did a tour, it would be like a very small East Coast tour. You know what I mean? But that's like looking way into the future right now. But I mean, you got to think I I work, you know, I, I have yeah. obligations here. So it's hard to just uproot and go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I couldn't remember. So I definitely hopped on to YouTube and I wanted to see your video. I ran out. It looks like you got one visualizer going on with uh, Deception. So that, that's, that's good. I love visualizers. Um, yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of doing uh, too well, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, I think tell. it has like 25,000 views. Yeah. Something then, like that. Yeah. That's kind of ridiculous. I mean, but the, for the rock one has like five thirty. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm that's, saying. It's so me and, me and Seth, not to get into it too much, but me and Seth were trying to figure out what was going on. Cause it, me, neither of us were were running successful ads on it. We were we both use uh, Google Ads, and a lot of the time that just doesn't work. Like you yeah. get nothing. Like my my specific ad for that, the last time I checked it, which was yesterday, it's been up for uh, ever since that video came out, and I got uh, six clicks, and I spent like one cent you know, out of my budget. Like it does, it just doesn't work sometimes, but we looked in our uh, analytics on the broken curfew channel and it said it was coming from YouTube ads. And Weird. I'm like, it's not, I know it's not Seth. Cause like, why is Seth going to drop, you know, that much money out of nowhere, yeah, you know? And then I'm over here. Like, I can't even afford that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it has a, I think somebody's in, doing it, you know, somebody's yeah. doing it. I think it's because I'm in Japan. It doesn't happen as often, but I know when I'm under US VPN, sometimes ads or will be music videos like that. So maybe that's yeah, what it's and I through. and I think that's what's happening, but that still doesn't tell us who is doing it. Somebody must have really liked it. I've never, I haven't talked about this publicly yet, and so I'm a little bit excited. But it's 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 very weird. Like it's very weird. So. I think while we're on the subject, it works. Uh, I was a little cryptid about it earlier, but you posted about um, something really awesome, which is your music is to be featured in a film. Yeah. Um, directed by I, Josh Graves. And uh looks like it's a horror film. So that's going to be freaking awesome. Yeah. Um, I funny thing about the uh, Josh, I think, right. Like, I think that's his name, the director. Yeah. He, uh, he, I look, I added him on Facebook and we have like eight mutual friends and it is so weird. The guy that married me and my wife, like our, uh, whatever the word is, um, he does say that again. Sorry, my cat. Oh yeah. You're good. You're good. Um, he, he's friends with him. He does like horror movie stuff, like indie stuff. He's friends with him. Then, uh, of course, Seth is friends with him. And then my other buddy I actually saw today uh, is friends with him. And he likes going to a bunch of shows and stuff. But I'm like, dude, this guy isn't even from around here, you know. But it's a it's a small world, you know. I I, I, I had no idea who this guy was prior to that post. And, uh, yeah, Josh Graves here. And, uh, no, I, I, just think, I just think it's sick all around. Like, 
um, I never thought that I could do that. <laughs> so that's cool. Um, having somebody watch any form of media and my music be in it, you know, that's a really interesting way to run into a band, you know? So, uh, uh I'm very thankful for that. It, it's, it's cool. But like I said, I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, I have no idea what parts of the song. All I know is deception will be the song on the album or on the, uh, the movie soundtrack. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what they do with it. You know, it's pretty um, cool though. I'm definitely going to watch it when it comes out. You know, I'm going to be right on it. <laughs> that's, that's something interesting. There's a, a, a TikTok account. I follow sound mind beats community. Um, sound mind. He is a sync licensed artist out of Denver, Colorado. Um, he does music reviews and different things. And then they do the sound mind community where it's like three different producers, um they're they're massive like the they have spotify mix mixing masking engineers with over a million plays or their platinum mixers with different songs um and okay. uh he hit i think the mo what he said last tiktok live was a big bulk of his income is from sync licensing that he does and most of the music that he writes is for sync licensing and lately muse uh movies have been a big one um yeah uh i forget the name of the band but whoever did the stranger things music by the end of that first season i'm pretty sure they were like set you know yeah like they made a lot of money uh doing that and that and that's crazy it's just because they happened to be in that position as far as the production of the show went and it did well and that's all it took you know i uh, think that's the, awesome the nostalgia for 80s music is cool too i'm i'm pretty sure i'm tired of hearing running up a hill by this point but oh um, my gosh it's i didn't like it to start <laughs> <laughs> it's getting a new generation into music that you know they may have not found before and and yeah. into gen z that's their classic rock that's like their led zeppelin is yes yeah. metallica which is just crazy to think uh think about and just makes me feel old as a 33 year old guy so uh, yeah i, I mean it it's it's weird because for me it's like the past few years i've noticed the difference uh with the younger generations and like you don't realize it when you're you know 19 or 20 because you're still kind of you know or at least not for me in my situation i i i was like i don't know they're just you know two years younger than me a year younger than me as time goes on like i'm 25 now seeing the the like uh my my brother-in-law is is he just turned 18 he is very different uh my buddy is uh dating a girl that uh is he's 25 she's 23 they're both music teachers awesome people but her she is the funniest person i've ever met like her humor is so like it's weird because like the memes and stuff that the the younger generations like consume it shapes their sense of humor and to me i think it's really funny but it's like obviously different than what i'm used to you know what i mean and it's like different things like that i'm like wow this is uh this is weird because this is how it feels to get old <laughs> you know what i mean like you're realizing, oh, that's that's young people stuff, and you're like, wait a second. <laughs> I'm the I'm the oldest of three siblings, and um, the the middle child uh, is, I would say, they're on the the line for being a millennial or Gen Z, um, and then the youngest sibling is Gen Z. So it's it's just really interesting um, how gotcha. stuff stuff works out, and, um, music tastes. I know. Um, uh, Alter Hart was talking about how his family's musical taste influenced a lot of his stuff. And it's really, it's kind of like hard not to, because when you're a kid, you, you're not getting control of the radio. Uh, yeah, no. But I think, I think one of the, my favorite memories was with my dad, we were in the car when System of a Down released their song, um, BYOB, Bring Your Own Beer. And yeah. we, we, uh, we were able to hop radio channels. As soon as it was done, we found another rock station in Colorado that was playing it. And it was really fun just driving around, trying to see how many times we could listen to the song. Um, right. Right. It's so different. Oh which, man. System of a down is awesome too. That's such a good band. Today. Um, 
I don't want to sound like a repeat thunder. So anybody that saw the Alter Heart episode, I'm sorry if I'm bringing this up, but um, Rick Rubin was talking about their song. I want to say it's, I got it wrong last time, but it's Chop Suey. There's a verse. Um, they couldn't figure out what to do in this specific spot. So Rick said um, to Sergi, just grab a book on the shelf, pick something, and that's what we'll do. And he happened to pick the Bible, and it's the New Testament, and it's where Christ is in the garden. Um, think I want to say that's where it is. It's uh, where he's lamenting, like, have I been forsaken? Um, and so that's what became in the song, which doesn't right. really, f- which is why a lot of people are like, wait a minute, are these Christians? <laughs> So and it's like no, they're just literally saying stuff in that song. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they're just being crazy. It's awesome. So yeah, nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, while we're on the topic, do you do you think uh how Christian metal is evolving right now? Uh what role do you think your band is playing in that? Um, honestly, I don't know. And uh it's kind of a weird it's a weird thing because on one end I love it. You know, I like being, uh, for lack of better words, I guess, accepted into this community, you know, um, like blue fire horizon had me on their podcast for the, that was the first podcast I've ever done. It was very nerve wracking. So I didn't know what to expect, but, uh, from that point on, it was like, there's like a, a steady fan base happening and it's really awesome and they're really great people from from what i've seen you know um but then on the other end you have like the the normal guys you know that i kind of identify with more you know um where they just post random stuff i don't post personal or random stuff all that well i'll post like pictures that's as personal as it gets but i'm not going to tell you about my problems you know but i see a lot of that too and i've noticed a weird ego and, and and I'm not I'm not talking junk about anyone, but I've noticed there's a it's like everyone's different, obviously. But when you when you take all these bands and centralize them in in this Christian metal community, you're gonna get everything. It's not all the same deal, you know what I mean? But uh, I've noticed that it's not much different than any other music community. You know, you got your people that are like all about themselves, and then you got your people that are extremely humble. Then you got your people that are focused on this or focused on that, you know, it's, it's not all the same, but, uh, that being said, I can only speak for the people that actually enjoy my music and like actually have it as a daily listener type deal, whether it be one song or a whole album, you know, um, I know they're out there and it's fantastic. And I hope more people, you know, uh, do the same, but as part of the community, I'm going to be honest with you. I, um, I'm more like lately I've been more fixated on the label um, and just kind of that, that I feel like that's more of a tight knit thing. So like, as far as like the whole Christian metal community, I hope I'm making sense as part part of the whole Christian metal community. I don't know. I really don't. Um, I don't, I don't know how many people like what I'm doing or uh, how many people might be like, this isn't real Christian music, you know, like, I don't, I don't know you know, cause it's just, it's gotten so broad, you know? Um, but as far as like, you know, the label, like they've been super accepting and it's like from the interactions we get through the label and the people that found my music through the label, it's, it's been really solid, you know, it's very hopeful. And I, I know there's more people out there that'll be right on board, you know, but yeah, ba- basically as a whole community, it's just like, it's like going in deathcore snobs on Facebook, you know, it's I'll just like, I love that. I'll, I'll love that. <laughs> yeah. But you get what I mean. It's like, yeah. just cause we all like deathcore doesn't mean we're even close to the same type of people, like in any sense of it, you know? Um, my, I think this is more related to the generation of what is the zeitgeist. And I hate using that term so much, um, <laughs> but the zeitgeist is, a lot of the selfishness of what people have, they aren't willing to support each other. Um, and we give so much time and money and attention to these big conglomerates and, and, and people where the money's not even going to reach the neighborhood. And oh we've gosh, really right. sold uh, the American dream has really been sold to third, 
third world countries uh, at the cost of the American people. And um, I feel like that's why we have songs like Oliver Anthony Music's, uh, you know, rich men, oh, yeah. rich men going up big and um, kind of generational differences and how music is being done and how record labels are terrified right now. Like one They're of the least business, desirable. Man. They're scared. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going in a, a new way and I don't know what part I'll play in it, but I think you are definitely in there. Um, I'm seeing conversations about things differently. Um, I mentioned earlier about my uh, friend and mentor, Screamy Mimi. <clears throat> uh, I didn't even bring him up. He was somebody at work was talking like, Hey, you do music. Have you seen this dude? He does memes. I was like, you'll never believe this. I'm not trying to brag, um, but he gave me a music lesson. Um, cause I, I couldn't get with David because of, uh, schedule conflicts and, um, screamy was open and it was pretty dope. And here's this thing. And, um, he pulled the Spotify and I sent a little clip of it to uh screamy to show like, Hey dude, I found you in the wild. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, That's awesome. Um, and the other day in the gym, this is similar topic. I'm going off here, but, uh, I saw a guy doing a routine and what was really weird was that morning I watched one of the bigger fitness influencers discussing like why it's a must at hit for his exercise. It's called a sissy squat, which is really weird. It's like <laughs> you're, you're laying, you're squeezing the barbell on a Smith machine. And what you're trying to do is overload your, uh, quadricep muscles and strengthen the knee by basically doing the the the, uh what's that thing um on cruise ships where they hold the stick out and you like bend below it um it's basically what you're doing but with uh, some weight limbo Limbo. yeah you're basically doing limbo with a a weighted bar (laughs) and i was like this is going to sound so weird but uh were you watching tnf this morning and how do you like that exercise that you just finished (laughs) (laughs) and he was like i was watching tnf so It's so we're, I feel like that seven degrees of separation is very much smaller um, now with the internet than it oh, was yeah. in our parents' time. So, yeah, 100%. And I, I agree with you. Um, I think that uh, the, I think the, the tables are turning when it comes to music. More and more people like are leaving the just mainstream radio music kind of deal. Um, which is good for artists like us, you know, uh, but I feel like the indie labels are going to be all that's left as far as like a, a realistic thing. Cause I don't know if you're familiar with this, but like, uh, industry plants, yes. I, I'm convinced that's a completely real thing and it is. there's endless examples. And I feel like that's the only way that these labels are staying afloat. And unless they can do it really convincingly, I don't think they're going to be able to keep running with it because like, okay, ice spice. I heard about this girl that has like two songs or something, you know, she might have more, I don't know. Um, now, but like at the time she's like blowing up and it's like, okay, this is quite obviously. And she's in everything out of uh-huh. nowhere. It's like, she signed the contract, you know? And, and yeah. that's just how it is right now. You know? Um, not a lot of the, like, usually if you're finding like awesome bands, that are uh, getting notoriety, they they don't always just go to Roadrunner, you know, if just because they have the chance, because it's not always the best deal, especially if they can, if they're bringing in a lot of income uh, on their own. Like, what what incentive is a label going to do when I already know how, what I'm worth, you know? Yeah, like Luke Bryan, um, I, I listened to his Joe Rogan, and that was basically like why he got out of the Navy was because he was hitting platinum on YouTube. And they're like, look, doc, you can't be in the Navy anymore because uh, if I give you an order, you can just tell me to go F myself because you, you're you making so, – you, this is not good, so you're going to have to get out. So, like, <laughs> he did that. And so like he was in a weird position where he was already big before. And so like for the label, it was like, hey – you're by yourself. We'll get you bands. We'll set you up on a touring bus. Like for him, it worked. Um, I remember listening to jelly roll talk about his thing. I'm giving away. I, I listened to Joe Rogan, um, a lot. Yeah, that, but, that's uh, fair. Ain't nothing wrong with Joe. Rogan. Um, jelly roll was same thing. He would already blown up and he found a label and a contract and it worked for him. And meanwhile, we have Oliver Anthony music out here telling, you know, record labels to get bent. 
Um, yeah. And so, then in, he got Joe Rogan. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, he, yeah. he saw Joe Rogan and that was it. <clears throat> like he's not, and, he's and, probably going to be in the, in the independent music sphere for a long time now, you know, uh, he burned some bridges, but they, I think they need to be burned. Um, yeah. And, and I don't mean to say this because there is a whole industry. I, I remember uh, being in Alabama and going to muscle shoals and seeing this, historic recording studio where so many big Southern rock bands went and played through and, and getting to go to the music hall of fame um, in Alabama. Um, there are talents and people and, you know, mixing and mastering engineers and great million dollar recording studios and stuff. But at the same time, they also, you know, they've got to, you know, they got to bring in the next hundred dollars and th there's a lot of soulless business transactions with yeah. it that, I feel like the music listeners can tell, like you can see. And I remember you brought up I Spice, like there was people dissecting, like she is an industry plant. And these are the five top reasons why one, this video she took the picture of was geo synced to being a block away from a music label. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, it's like, no, that's wow. exactly, <laughs> that's exactly. And you know what? I'm going to be a hundred percent honest with you. I didn't look at anything about her. I still don't know about her. I my wife showed me this really gross TikTok of her. Um, and that's pretty much the most I've seen uh of her, other than hearing about her in literally everything. But uh I think uh no, no, but my point was is uh I didn't look into her, I knew it right away because they do it's you can predict it now. Yeah. Now at first I was learning about the Lil Xan and the uh there's people that think Post Malone's an industry plant because he blew up off that one song, but I don't know if if he's an industry plant, he's probably their best one. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I like his music. I don't I don't think it's bad, and he's he's been pretty persistent, and I think he's independent. But that's besides the point. Um, they've done it so much, and it's the same thing. You know, and, it's the same. It's the same thing. And I hate to be like super Christian, but it's like. All the, the the music is either super babylonian or or if you look at the rap scene right now there's so many rap artists you know in the music videos they have an art choreographer who's telling them like hey um can you do this in the background oh what's his name hobson is it Hopson? oh i saw i saw that today yeah he was he he basically flew in for his like doing a set he's rehearsing by himself he you know, they tell him, here's your cue. You're going to come out. And he was just waiting to go out on stage. He goes out on stage, has no idea what's being played behind him is um, basically a bunch of cult symbols and satanic stuff. And um, he, he had and to come out. Like, I'm singing this ill mind seven song and it's pretty edgy, you know? Yeah. It, it's like a, his own struggles with the Bible and God and stuff. Yeah. But then if you mix that song with <laughs> what was being showed behind them, it's, like yes. he, his words were, it's not the vibe that that's me, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and it's funny. Cause I looked at the comments on that, not to cut you off, no uh, worries. but, uh, I looked at the comments and a lot of people think that he's just covering his butt because, uh, he's mm. gotten to that level. Cause uh, it's not really hidden anymore. Um, that they're blatantly into like satanic stuff. Like, yeah. At, 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 at the very least on an outward uh like visual sense but uh obviously it doesn't stop there like if you're if you're willing to do that and basically pledge your devotion to such things like it, it probably goes deeper than just a few uh horrible music videos and concerts you know what i mean i th i think that's something interesting too um that music has always had this like close relation to like dark darkness. Yeah. And light at the same time. Um, I mean, we have date King David, who's probably the most, one of the pr most prolific individuals in the old Testament had an entire book of Psalms of things that he would sing. And he was a known musician. David was a musician. Right. Um, a lot of the old, testament readings would would have been with musical instruments and like look how many times it talks about like the lyre and the harp and the satyr and um music and and and, and symbols of of it so it's like it's really interesting um i don't know if you're a big lord of the ring fan um but in the lore the the lord of the rings universe was formed through these 
angelic divine demigod beings literally singing a song together um it just shows like how powerful music can be yeah um, it, it's absolutely insane um you can it, it is like without a doubt the number one way for us as humans to express literally anything you know it's i mean same thing with the uh, videography but like i feel like music is more easy access and it's just a different you know it's just a different art form you know but music it definitely does hold a lot of power probably wrap up the conversation here soon i, I hear my wife getting up and i have some other stuff to do but uh um, yeah, we, good, we, we can care, continue on. Um, I have a good friend, Leland Tanner. Um, I actually have him on my podcast. He's one of the episodes and he does Christian rap, but it's not what you expect of Christian rap. It's not like Lecrae. It's not like this other, it's his own thing. And he basically, you know, started doing it in high school, doing these rap battles. And he actually got really good at it and realized a lot of these people didn't understand, you know, English and, and some of the writing and grammar and um, structures and he got really good at it. And I, I think his music's great. And um, if I, I could be taking this out of context, but I'm pretty sure he had been uh, reached a label reached out to him, but what they were giving him was like, we like you as an artist, but we don't like what you're putting out. And he's like, here's the thing. I am going to be putting out my music about God and about the second coming of Christ and the need of repentance. I'm not going to be singing about what Babylon needs because we have too much of that. Like everywhere you turn is Babylon here, Babylon that. And um, yeah, I I believe in that a hundred percent. I believe it. I mean, that, that is how it is right now, you know? Um, So that's why I love. So I got into, um, Christian music after I came back from my service mission, uh, because for me, my day-to-day life for two years was getting up and and going and doing community service or teaching people about Jesus Christ and and reading the Bible to people or doing whatever I could to make the community better. And then suddenly it's like, you got to go home and live a normal life and you're not ministering constantly and you've got to be selfish. So there's a lot of like depression with that. And so I found myself listening to a lot of alternative and metalcore um, and getting really into the scene, like, uh, um, uh, uh, a midi affliction or the color morale or a lot of yeah. uh, big, big songs. And then I, I was like, ah. but then the day it's, you know, why do I feel depressed all the time? Well, it's, I'm listening to songs that are only talking about what it's like to be depressed or not be happy. Yeah. And then uh, I had a coworker who once thought I was an atheist because, you know, I'm listening to slaughter to prevail or thy art is murder um, and how much music influences it. And so I kind of left the metal scene and i just christian music is to me boring because who wants to hear a billionth take of a hymn or um, an acapella version or this like soft k-love radio pop song stuff that and so i i don't (laughs) no and i i found a band in the midst of lions was my real introduction to christian deathcore and i'm like what are these guys doing and the answer is nothing because they broke up and then i found (laughs) crimson armada and i'm like what are these guys doing and the answer is nothing because they also broke up and so um i was having trouble finding christian artists and so i took a, a a page out of my friend leland's book and decided why don't i make christian music the way I want to listen to it. Um, it's terrible. I admit it. It's not for everybody. It's kind of like uh, uh, a, a strong liquor. It's not going to be for everybody. 151 right. proof is, uh, it's not like <laughs> your Heineken or whatever. Um, right. It's, right. It's different. It's like um, eating dry aged beef. You know, not everyone's into dry aged beef steaks. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's its own thing. And I'm hundred percent being okay. I'm not trying to, go big or blow up but i have one more song on my playlist that i can listen to um and actually i I do want to pause real fast i do have a playlist and you're um a good majority i think i have like 1200 songs on there now um or not 1200 uh 300 ish songs uh my math is hard oh you good Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
um yeah it's upon this rock playlist uh it's got 141 songs in about seven hours and so amongst that are just people i've been finding and and, and throwing on there oh that's um, awesome i'm gonna go through that because that's on spotify correct yeah yeah it's on spotify i can send it i don't i don't use spot i use youtube music spotify is something i see from the outside kind of mm. just having stuff on there but i'm gonna it, it is the place for finding playlists like that. And that's what I'm interested in. So I'm definitely going to win on. when TikTok music drops. I'm going to be pushing so hard on there because that's going to be massive for finding people. Cause it's basically going to take like Facebook where people can comment on stuff, but it's going to be a song. Right. We're going to have that ability to comment on there. Now, you know um, I have somebody that I know that they hate, posting controversial things but that's the only thing that draws people's attention is like that is true they know when somebody starts an argument about some nerd lore that it's going to generate views on their thing because then the algorithm sees hey there's an influx of people commenting let's increase the amount of people who are seeing this and so it blows up that's how viral works and so i kind of want to look through that but uh um i think it's really really um important to have uplifting music and then on the topic i've had somebody argue with me that that deathcore is satanic because of how it comes and i countered them with this thought and i've i found a couple verses in the old testament um and this is from job chapter 37 um it's kind of at the end of everything job goes through um and it's testifying to god's control of nature and his reign and terrible majesty and in the old testament um vernacular terrible isn't like what we would assume terrible would be like almost unfathomable um uh incomprehensible like that's the way yeah. terrible is implying and so verse one says at this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of this his place hear attentively the noise of his voice the sound that goeth out of his mouth he directeth it under the whole heaven and his lightning under the ends of the earth after it a voice roareth he thundereth with his voice of his excellency and he will not stay with them when his voice is heard god thundereth marvelously marvelously with his voice great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend um and i really feel like deathcore needs to be taken back from this like overtly satanic stuff and i really see christian deathcore being the primary um a, a bigger component to the genre than what it has previously been oh yeah and it's like it it a lot of it does come from a dark play it, it, there's it's like for uh um i guess lack of better words it's like things carry a, a bad energy or a good energy to them you know like yes. just negative and like some sort of negativity it, it will drag you down as in the long run you know mm. and uh uh, I I do listen to a lot of secular music, but I will. There's definitely times where I'm like overwhelmed by it, where it's like actually affecting how I feel, and that's when I'm like, all right, maybe later. You know what I mean? It, it's definitely a thing, and I, I understand seeking out Christian music for that reason too, because it's like, you know, why not? <laughs> you know, mm. um, it, it, it's the way. You know, so like. Uh, and like you said earlier, like I really like the art is murder as well, but it is like blatantly anti-Christian music, you know, and I don't want to fill my mind with that. Yeah. You know? But at the same time, it, it, it's more talking about the message of how it's used people in power, corrupt people to their devious means. Um, like the Holy Roman empire, not to go on that subject, but how they <laughs> kind of ruined Christianity of what it oh, was. Yeah. Um, uh, or the Spanish Inquisition or hunting witches that, you know, it, it, the evidence is <laughs> uh, looking at today's cancel culture, you know, in the 1800s, that was, <laughs> she's a witch, burn her. Um, yeah. So the, the, the adversary is very keen to get us to turn. That's a really her, good, so. uh, that's a really good parallel there. I never thought about that. And I don't know if you're into CS Lewis, but if you haven't, uh audio book his uh book the screw tape letters it's about a higher devil training a, a lower imp on the ways of corrupting man 
Um, okay. And C.S. Lewis was very good friends with uh, um, uh, um, Tolkien. And the screw tape letters have very profound impacts. And it's from a very interesting perspective, but it, it, it shows. And one of the things, um, I'm not going to quote it per se, because that's not the, I'm not a uh, narrate. I'm an impromptu, not an orator, but uh, right, right. he basically states that, you know, um, these methods seem new, but they're always the same thing. You know, uh, they're, they're tricked and dallied up differently, but it's the same methods. Yeah. You know, the 1800s, you know, she's a witch is the same thing as, um, oh, they're a racist or I'm not condoning racism or people saying stupid stuff, but the, right. the parallels of pitchfork and the whole mob mentality, it's yeah. not gone away. It's just, it's become something different. Um, and, and some people, uh, and in some cases people are wrongly accosted and it doesn't matter. The damage is already done. And, and right, cases. right, so, right. Um, yeah. And you know what? All it took was like one, one witch situation and they were crazy. And the same with everything else, <laughs> you know, whether you believe that or not. Uh, I, I think that's fun to think about, uh, kinda, you know, being, being on this end of history, at least, but like, same with the people with the whole cancel thing. It's like some people actually kind of, you know, aren't that cool, you know, but then a lot of them are like, all right, you're being a little ridiculous, you know? Yeah. The, the court of public opinion can be dangerous. Um, and then oh, yeah. uh, the, was it the 1996 Olympics in jo Atlanta, Georgia? Um, somebody put a bomb um, that went, went off and, would have caused a lot more damage, but a, a security guard who was a wannabe police officer and overweight and kind of um, lower descent, more of a simple individual um, noticed it and felt something was wrong and got people out of there. Well, uh, a reporter and an FBI agent ended up turning the court of public opinion on him so much that the FBI stopped going after the actual person to pursue Richard Jewell as the primary suspect and eventually they just ran out of things that didn't make sense. Um, it, right. it could not have been him that planted the bomb. And um, uh, years later, the, the actual guy who did it um, was caught, but the media didn't care. You didn't hear that. You didn't yeah. see that. So it's like this man's life is almost ruined and put in jail for, you know, or in the black communities. I don't know if you know the story of Emmett, um, uh, Emmett Smith, I think his name is. So like or Emmett Till, I think it's Emmett Till. Um, it's Emmett Till. I'm pretty sure it's Emmett Till. Emmett Smith is a football player. Emmett <laughs> Emmett Till was an African boy who was abducted, tortured, and lynched in Mississippi. Um, after being accused of offending a white lady, Carolyn Brandt, at her family's grocery store, and oh, man. Um, she later, in her old age, said she made it all up. Um, yeah, that that is absolutely horrible. And, yeah so it just so shows bad. you know um the adversary doesn't really it's like uh to use a car metaphor it's it's still the same mustang you know what i mean um yeah oh yeah man it uh, definitely is but yeah it's really great to have this uh conversation to look for you um there's yeah it was awesome here um for any aspiring musicians wh what would you think that they should do with their music um to to kind of tread the similar path to yours okay well first off you don't want to tread the same path as me you want to get as much knowledge as you can about recording mixing and mastering that you can as early as possible because i went through about Let's say I think my first recorded music was like 2013. So uh, I, I'd say it took me about seven to eight years of uh, doing really dumb things that affected my music. Uh, when in when if somebody had just told me, uh, like right off the bat, like "Hey, do this," it would have saved me so much time and so much just so much trial and error that would have been just gone, you know, which I appreciate learning on my own. It's great. But, um, learn about quantizing, learn about metronomes. Not everybody can mix and master. And if they can, they don't always mix and master their own music and to find a good producer that you can, uh, uh, explain your, uh, vision to, 
and uh, just practice writing and always play your instruments. You know, um, you don't have to be a, a crazy person who plays all day, every day, and you don't have to play more than one instrument to be a successful musician. Um, but for me personally, it's always been something on my mind, writing music. And uh, it, it's never left. You know, if I take a break, I'm still thinking about my next album. I'm still thinking about the next EP. I'm still thinking about lyrics. You know, it's something that doesn't leave some of us. But if you have that, you best do something with it. Because I know a lot of people that are older than me that are fully capable and have all the ideas and all these great things that they, they can do, but they don't take action. So I'd say take action and research as much as possible. And uh, once again, metronomes are your best friend. Um, they will, it, it, you can have a wonderful song and if it's off time and sloppy, it, a lot of people aren't going to see it. You know, they're not going to see it as what it should be. So uh, quality and recording is important um quick example uh for the album set free i use this microphone i'm using right now for the metal vocals on it and i think personally in the mix i was not a fan of how it turned out so i i kind of held out uh, also with my guitar recording i used a rocksmith usb guitar cable to record di into reaper don't do that Get an interface as soon as possible and record your vocals, your bass, and your guitars through the interface. Don't cheap out. Don't do any of that. It's not. It's a huge. It's not a huge investment. You know, it's very cheap to be able to make music at, at home now. Um, so just that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's that's pretty much my main things. Um, do as much research as possible, and don't be too picky, but be picky and. You know, make sure you're networking with the right people because, you know, you want to as a musician, you want to put stuff out, you know, at the very least, whether it's popular or not, just put stuff out, you know, and uh, grow. Don't be afraid to grow and change. And also don't be full of yourself. You know, yeah. none of us are, are more special than the other when it comes to our art, you know. But yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I. uh my my first single i recorded it on this actual microphone and for the podcast it's it's okay it's a yeah. 90 dollar microphone but for different vocals it just it becomes too much and then um it's a straight usb plug-in there's really not any digital converting so the interface i have right now i have a sure 58 microphone plugged into it because oh yeah you go to any concert in the world, the Sure 58 is going to be the microphone on stage. That's it. It's, yeah. It's, it's very common. So, so you get you I something like that. You know, yeah. I have a knockoff version of that pretty much. It was like 120 bucks. The one I'm using now is $17 on Amazon. If that tells you yeah. anything about the quality yeah. of this microphone, Amazon actually has quite a good, if you type, um, you know, musician starter kits, there's, really good reasonably priced kits where it takes yeah. all these different things and puts it together. And they're good quality. Um, I have friends that uh have done that. Um, my can, only thing can. about those is the the software they usually come with are just a reskin of like Reaper or something. Yeah. But, or uh, other than that, the actual hardware version. stuff is great. Yeah. But yeah, it's well like, actually uh, I have this mic right here real quick. It's a SL40 is what it's called and it is a knockoff of uh the whatever you just said the, uh, the sure yeah yeah uh if i upgrade my mic to anything it's going to be a sure smb7 or something yeah uh, and that and that's what i'm i'm somewhere. working towards that it's just not smart to do right now <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah um that's a big one but still it's all I mean, it's all affordable as far as like a home musician goes you know yeah there's definitely ways you can do it and the interface makes a huge quality um there's a whole bunch oh of my technical gosh, things into it but it it makes it sound prettier is the it the really does part. like um, it's it's the best you're gonna get when you're at home i promise like you you could maybe mic up a amp um if you don't want to go digital but like other than that, like that is the way to go. Like you will see people in these big bands using interfaces in these studios. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a right. lot of the time, that's how it is. Like di digital stuff is, is just how it is now, especially with metal. And now but they have you want that good sound at home, get an interface, you know? Yeah. And now they have it to where I saw an advertisement for a software that can emulate your, um, your, physical analog 
uh, settings, your presets. Yeah. Um, and so you can change. So like it see it, it can understand what your presets are. And so when you're mixing, you can change it post mix. Yeah. So you don't have to basically go back and re-record it. And I'm like, holy cow, it's getting crazy. But uh, and that's and that's really cool. And it's like stuff like that's awesome. But there's some stuff where I'm like, all right, too much. You know, like you don't need to write the song for me, Mr. Computer. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but stuff, anything to make mixing easier and better, like I'm all for it, man. There are a lot of options out there, but uh, okay. yeah, man, uh, I think we're going to call it good. I'm going to pause the recording and talk to you offline real fast. But All right. Thanks, man. And awesome. Any final words? Where can people find your music? Thanks for having me. Uh, you can find my merch and my, uh, my CDs at uh, brokencurfewrecords.com. Um and uh, there's Bandcamp links there. All my lyrics are on my Bandcamp pages, my personal one and the one on Broken Curfew. Uh, the Broken Curfew one is uh, glay, G-L-A-E, B-C-R dot Bandcamp dot com. And uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm more active on Facebook. And uh, if, you, if you use Bandcamp, follow me on Bandcamp. I post messages on there. Not as frequently, but if there's a big update or a release coming soon. I'll usually say something on there.